Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on Facebook Live again. My name is Jason Levine, Principal Worldwide Evangelist for Adobe. And for the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about some of the latest innovations um, in Adobe Audition CC. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about, um, and this is really a theme across all of the updates in this current release, is just little efficiency makers inside of the applications. This first feature is something called Punch and Roll. This is something which any of you who've ever done any kind of recording, whether it's for ADR or even recording vocals with music, punch and roll is a really common technique. Now, just to set the stage, you could always punch in in Audition. Punch in is not new, nor is it unique. Frankly, in the digital nonlinear era, punch in kind of almost really doesn't matter, right? Because you have infinite tracks anyway. Who cares? You don't have to worry about getting it just right like we used to on tape. <sighs> Silly. Having said that, though, to be efficient, to keep things consistent on one track and one file and easy and manageable by the person who's doing the ADR, we really wanted to revamp the way and reimagine the way we kind of did punch and roll. So the concept here is that we have a short film that I'm going to show you. It's called Century by a Sacramento filmmaker named Mike Burton. And um, I want to do some voiceover, some ADR. And the idea with punch and roll is that you're doing your ADR, you're doing some kind of dialogue or voiceover, and you get to a certain point, and then maybe you make a mistake. So you wind back, you roll back, now you play back, and you want some pre-roll, and then you want to be able to hear what you did, and then you want to punch in at a specific spot and then keep rolling, punch and roll. So now you can do this very efficiently, and you even have keyboard shortcuts to allow you as the artist to control Audition so that you can really just keep moving, never stopping. And the real benefit here is that not only do you get the pre-roll so that you can hear yourself, of course, but because you can hear yourself before, because everything is perfectly timed, you can re-say things with the same tonality, with the same cadence, in the same voice, right? And previously, this, it was just not quite as elegant and a little bit more difficult to do. So down here at the bottom, I'm just going to start simply recording, but you'll notice if I zoom into our record button and right click or control click, we now have a punch and roll mode. So this is the mode that you're going to use for this specific feature. So I'm going to go into record here, and I'm going to start doing a little bit of voiceover. <clears throat> Make sure I've got some level on here, and it looks like I do. OK. And uh, let's give it a shot and see how I do. When you're young, you don't think about goals. In fact, everything you do is... OK, so I just made a mistake there, all right? Now, what I want to do, of course, is I want to wind back, and I want to punch in right at this spot. Now, to do that, of course, I need some kind of visual cues. So this kind of leads me into a feature that we added in the previous release. If I right-click on my video display under Video Preferences, We've added all kinds of time code overlays and other options in Audition now, specifically for ADR workflows. So you, know, you have the options here to resize and move your time code around, depending upon where you like to see it. You can also reference session time code or media time code. So if you've got cue sheets and you're actually doing replacing dialogue, this is kind of nice because the cues will often reference the media time code. So you've got options there. You can change background opacity and size. just makes it a lot easier. Now, under playback and recording, here's where you'll find your punch and roll options, where you can set your pre-roll, which in this case, I'll set it to around three seconds. And then you can have it display a pre-roll countdown timer. Right? So I'm watching that. I'm getting ready. It'll give me a flash. It goes into record seamlessly, and I just keep going. And because I can hear myself, I'll be able to do it in the same voice. <clears throat> So here we go. I'm in the place I want to do it in. Let's go ahead and hit punch and roll and keep on going. You don't think about goals. Everything, every day that you do, if you succeed, goal achieved. But the difference is, it doesn't always messed up again. OK. So you're kind of getting the idea now, right? So maybe I'll just say this one part again. And I might want to do multiple takes of this one section. If I go up to the Edit menu and I go into the Keyboard Shortcut Editor, now this is something that we added to Audition, I think, about a year ago. So this is now very consistent across Premiere, After Effects, Audition. If you go into the Search field and type Punch, there is an unassigned shortcut for Punch again. Now, you'll see that Punch and Roll itself 
also has a keyboard shortcut. I am, I am the worst with keyboard shortcuts. <clears throat> I'll be celebrating my 19th year at Adobe, and in 19 years, I know the same eight shortcuts across all of these applications. And it's all the standard ones, and undo is one of them. I don't remember what redo is. I don't know, I don't know why I, my brain just won't store it. I don't know. So I'm bad with shortcuts, but punch again is one that I want to use. So how do you set the shortcuts? Well, first we've got to see if it's available. I'm, I want to use P, so maybe if I do Shift Option P, whoops, oh no, not in this field, my mistake, hold on. All right, so we're gonna go to this one here. We go Shift Option P, Shift Option P. Okay, that is not taken, you can see it's empty. So under the shortcut area, I'm going to hit Shift Option P, add it there, okay? Click OK on that, and now this will ensure that if I use that shortcut, Shift Option P, it will punch in to the same spot every time at the same frame. So that way, I have an easy way to go through my takes and select the best one. And it's always at the same time code location in the exact same place, all right? So let's go ahead and Shift Option P this. You don't think about goals. Because every day, just waking up, just going to school, that's a goal. Riding your bike and not falling, that's a goal. Eating your, nope, okay, so let's do this. Wind back right here, all right, and shift option P. You don't think about goals. Because every day, just waking up, that's your goal. Going to school and not getting a bad grade, that's your goal. Successfully getting on your bike and not falling off, that's your goal. And it keeps rolling, okay? So now that I've done multiple takes, if I right click here, you can see all the various takes that I have. I can play back and audition the ones that I want. And the really cool thing about this is, now of course you're left with all of these files. And this is why I say punch in, in 2019 in, an, in a DAW nonlinear editor, it, it's almost like <laughs> you can always go to another track. You're, all, you're never erasing anything, right? It's always virtual. But what's nice about this is once you get the takes laid out, of course, the next step would be to comp this all together. And in most other DAWs, you do a bounce. But here, I can simply select the best takes, right click, control click, merge clips, and now it creates one file that contains your best take, which would seem as if we did it all in one take to begin with, all right? So really cool, really smooth and elegant, punch and roll. Again, any kind of voiceover, dialogue recording, podcast, ADR, so useful and we're so happy to now have this very efficient system in Audition. Also, because you have so many apps now, there's several apps that you can control Audition with via your phone or an iPad. You know, you can be in the vocal booth and you can be controlling all of this. All the engineer has to do is make sure your vocal levels are proper. That's it. Everything else you can control on set. Now, another little thing that we've done here um, is add uh, what we call ambience auto ducking. So a year ago, I showcased to you auto ducking for voice and music, right? This is an Adobe Sensei machine learning power technology that takes the guesswork out of having to draw keyframes to duck music underneath voice, right? You see this in everything, whether it's commercials, movies, whatnot. Music starts playing, someone's talking, music attenuates, gets lower in volume. You used to have to do this manually. We now have our Sensei technology doing it automatically. But we only had it for voice and music. And so many of our users reported that, you know, when I have voice and music, yes, that's great. But what often accompanies that too is sound design, right? If you want a good film, you want to sell your images, you've got to have good sound design. Here, there's bicycle sounds, nature sounds. So when they're talking, it's fine if the music drops, but if they're talking and suddenly all the ambient sound is just as loud, it's, it's weird, it sounds fake, right? So the ambient sound needs to drop too. So of course, you could go in and keyframe that manually, but what our users were doing, sort of the basis of how Essential Sound works. This is our Essential Sound panel. It was designed for editors and non-audio pros to be able to mix music easily. 
And the, fun the fundamental way that it works is you identify the type of content you're working with, dialogue, music, sound effects, or ambience. And by choosing those and tagging your media that way, you're then presented with a series of effects and filters that you would commonly use to process that. So what people were doing was they wanted ducking, but ducking was only available for music. So they were tagging ambient sound design as music so they could get the ducking functionality. There's nothing wrong with that, but then you were missing out on some of the other effects that we give you for ambience, like stereo expansion and other things. So now we're very happy to announce that we have ducking available when you tag your media as ambient. So any kind of sound design can be used with this. All right? So here now, what you're actually seeing is, I'll play this back for you, is this, whoops, is this is Sensei automatically detecting the volume levels and detecting the threshold and dropping the volume of the sound design every time there's talking and then ramping it back up automatically. Now you've got three basic settings in here. You've got a sensitivity control, which is basically your threshold, but it's variable. Your duck amount, how much do you want it to duck? Maybe we want it to duck a little bit more. And by the way, when I let go of this, watch, I'll do it really extreme. Watch those dotted lines. Do you see how they're moving dynamically? Because Sensei is scanning the file and reading these changes live. And then you also have a fade control. So again, how quickly does it begin to duck, right? Do you want it extreme? Or do you want it to sort of gradually, in a sinusoidal type fade, fade down, right? So that's what the fade time represents. And similarly, if I increase that fade time, you can see how it's changing down below. All right? So let's take a quick listen to this. Adventure is all around you. Waiting. All right? Maintains, because there's a lot of, I almost said jungle, a lot of forest. All you need is a little bit of courage. Right? Makes sense. I love that particular spot there because you really hear the birds chirping right there. Now, again, it's a matter of tagging this as ambience. You get this functionality. That's it. It's super simple. Now, of course, the next question is, well, what if I want to manually tweak these keyframes? Maybe there's a specific piece of sound design that I want to be as loud as the dialogue or whatever it is. <clears throat> this also applies to ducking for uh, music. This checkbox here, monitor clip changes, this is basically, this should actually say Adobe Sensei. Because if you uncheck this box, now you have manual keyframes that you can now come in here and adjust volume levels. You can add additional keyframes. You can do whatever you want and manually tweak the way you would have done it before the way you would have done it outside of the Essential Sound panel anyway. If, however, you want it to then re-automate, basically redoing or removing the changes you made, click on Monitor Clip Changes, and Sensei goes back to the way it was. And based on these settings, duck amount, fade, sensitivity, it can change, right? It's never, never necessarily always the same. So you're going to get different results based on how you adjust sensitivity and such. This is so easy, so useful. If you're not a pro, keep in mind for the audio pros in here, if you're used to doing uh, ducking via a sidechain compressor, you can still do that in Audition. But that's, that's for an audio, you know, that's for me, that's for like, people who are just audio nerds who just like using their favorite VST plugin. Mine of choice is a DBX-160A, if you must know. I still love it. Or a Yuri 1176 by Waves. Um, and I love going in there and using those as a side chain. But that's a lot of work for an editor who just wants to duck music <laughs> or duck ambience. So you can do it manually, or you can use this functionality here. It's also worth pointing out that ambience auto ducking is also available in Premiere Pro's Essential Sound Panel too. So you have the same functionality on the Audition side. This was actually dynamically linked from Premiere anyway. If we go back to Premiere, all the settings that we have here, you would see in Premiere Pro. Really nice, OK? OK, so that's a little bit on ambience auto-ducking. Now, I want to talk to you about a couple of, again, some other little tweaks and things that we made in Audition um, over the last 
couple of versions here. I'm going to switch the session. You may have noticed this right away, which was that if you haven't opened Audition in a while, it looks way more colorful. And that's by design, because we redid all of our color palettes and a huge portion of the, of the UI to just look and feel better, right? The colors are more vibrant. If I zoom in here, you'll see we've got even like rounded corners just to improve that user experience. If I right click and go to track color, what you'll now see is a new color palette that now conforms to the same colors in Premiere Pro. If you've ever dynamically linked content from Premiere into Audition, prior to about a year, uh, seven months ago, you probably noticed that like Premiere, if you had I don't even remember all the labels, but you know, if you had lavender and forest and whatever it was, <laughs> brown, and you went into audition, the lavender was sort of purple-ish. It wasn't the same purple. And the forest was green, but not the same green. In the, well, brown is brown. But even that was different because they weren't using the same color palettes. Now you have the exact same custom colors, same custom palettes. They're still all user definable. The difference is that now the default colors, they're just more vibrant. They just look better, OK? Also what we've done, taking a little a hint from Photoshop, is we've made it easier for you now to work with very large sessions by basically having a layers panel with a visibility control, which we call the tracks panel. So up in the window menu here, if I go into Tracks, what you'll now see is that you have this Tracks panel, which is also color coded. So let's say that you know here I'm doing my mix. All right, and for the next uh, for the next half hour, I'm just going to focus on voiceover and music and controlling my um, my subgroups that have reverb and other ambient effects on them. So I don't need to see all these other tracks. So what I can do is in the Tracks panel, I can come in here, and I can start to hide all the things that I don't need to see. They're still all there. They're just not revealed to me. And then I can go large on this. Here, I'm going to shrink this up and just have everything fill the space a little more elegantly, like this, all right? Increase these ever so slightly, OK? And I can come into my Tracks panel, and I can say under Track Visibility, let's save this as a preset. So we'll save this music and buses as preset one. Okay? And then maybe we'll do another one where it's just the sound effects. So I can come in here. And now let's mute the music and the voiceover. Okay, so now it's just sound effects. Track visibility, save preset two. Okay? So now I'm doing that. Okay, now I want to reveal everything again. Well, we have some presets in here. First and foremost, show all tracks. So now everything is back again. We've also redesigned the zoom out so it'll show everything that's in the session very easily. Oh, I just want to go back to my dialogue mixing. OK, that was in preset one. There's our dialogue tracks. OK, now let's go back to our sound effects mixing, sound design. There's all of our sound design. So it's a simple thing, but really, again, if, you, if you're doing a lot of sound design, if you're doing a lot of multi-tracking, the UI gets very cluttered very quickly. And while I love the ability to manually resize things, um, you'll also notice that you just now it's very elegant if you want to shrink your tracks. They stay very vibrant and highlighted even when they're small. It's wonderful. But the UI gets very crowded very quickly, so the track visibility uh, capability just makes it that much easier to organize your sessions, move things around. As you move tracks around, by the way, it also respects those changes. So you'll see here as I moved SFX2 up in the, in, the, in the chain, it moved it here as well. So nice, so elegant, so cool to have that, OK? All right, so the last two things I'm going to show you here before I send you off um, are some new effects that were added in the October release, two brand new effects. One for denoise, a brand new denoising algorithm, and another for dereverbing. Yes, now if you didn't know that, again, it's been out for a couple of months. This is one of those holy grail effects that people have been asking for forever. I need to remove the echo, right? How many of you have wanted to do that? Yes, nerds, yes. Raise them up. 
I'm among you. This is very difficult to do, right? Because while, and there's all kinds of ways, I mean, I'm the first to say it's, it's really difficult, nay, almost impossible. Because while you can theoretically remove echo and ambience, and many of my engineer friends and colleagues and Duran, whom I work with at Adobe on the audition team, you know, we know little tricks, like you can use a noise gate. So you're not really getting rid of the, the echo, you're so much as you're just cutting it off. And then you can use some, you know, careful curves so that it just sounds a little more musical, a little more natural. It might still be echoey. That was the way we used to do it. But, and you could get it pretty good. But the problem is you could never, you can't put the microphone closer to the person speaking, right? That's the problem. Well, we've actually tackled a bit of that problem via a little bit of AI, a little machine learning in our de-reverb effect which will account for that space and automatically readjust the amplitude of your subject to push it forward, okay? Now, this is going to be very impossible to hear here. So you're going to have to trust me. Do you trust me? Your silence says it all. Thank you. Let me show you these UIs. And let me show you why, first and foremost, these are so cool. First of all, if you want to do this in Essential Sound, let's say you don't want to do any tweaking whatsoever. We just want to denoise something. How do you leave a footprint? All right, so I'm going to mark this as dialogue. I'll come in here under repair. Here now is a brand new noise algorithm. Now, we had reduced noise before. Previously, this used our adaptive noise effect. Still in there, by the way. Very good sounding. Really good. Very good for specific, specific things. We have five types of noise reduction. Five, six, a hundred, I don't know. We have a lot because noise varies, right? Consistent noise, HVAC noise, random noise, wind noise, hums, you know, ringing, all different. So we have different effects to do that. This now uses our brand new denoiser. So if you want to do it the easy way, you don't care about the parameters, you can simply enable reduce noise. And here on a single slider, as I play and drag this, well, first you're gonna have to leave home. So before go to the crazy place. Even if no one's coming, you're gonna have to after. itch to fail. And then start from scratch. If before, you're gonna take advice, make sure you remember how to dance. After. Because the beat of your own drum is Okay. Now I'm overdoing it a little bit in the venue here. But that's it. It's one slider. And by the way, on good speakers in a quiet environment, I can't hear what's happening. I told you I speak the truth. This is pretty freaking amazing. Like, as denoisers go, it's a new algorithm. That's the other thing, is our older algorithms, they were just older. They're still good. I still use our classic noise reduction, which is from Centrillium Cool Edit Pro, which is like a thousand years old. It's very complex. It still sounds good, but you have to know what you're doing. So if you don't care, you've got one slider. Now, let me also point out, when you use the denoiser here in Essential Sound, it actually is applying that effect at the clip level in your effects rack, which means if you double click here, you now have access to all of the parameters. But here's the thing, friends, I say all, there's two. That's why this is also so good. Two controls. Here's what you need to know. The obvious one is amount. So this amount slider, represented in percentage, this is the same as reduce noise, OK? Real easy. You can see they're even moving simultaneously. The other thing is this. And this is, this is just where we got it right, where it's so good. And you don't need to be an audio engineer to get way better results. Because you have essentially five processing curves we all know like what EQ curves look like, right? Think of like a graphic equalizer. Everybody know what a graphic equalizer is? <laughs> Who was born in the 70s or earlier? Okay? You have all these different bands, right? And you like pull down the bands. If you remember if your parents had a stereo system and they used to do the little smile, that would be bassy and trebly and all the mids were scooped out, right? These curves represent something like that. So the first one here is all frequencies. Remove noise on all frequencies. And I typically don't recommend this because 
you might not have extreme high-end noise. Maybe you just have low-end noise. So you don't want to pull, you don't want to reduce noise from an area where it doesn't exist. That's what gives you artifacts. That's what gives you those swishy, swirly, metallic, hateful things that everybody's encountered. So if you go to this curve, this one focuses only on lower frequencies. And you can see the low end is boosted and everything else is cut. It only focuses on the low end. Or this one, this makes complete sense. What does that do? Focuses on the mid-range, which is like your vocal range. It doesn't touch the bass, it doesn't touch the treble. The next one here, it's the opposite of that. This is the smile. This is the 80s. My parents thought this was awesome. I remember listening to Diana Ross upside down and hear and then occasionally you'd hear like because all the mids were scooped. You couldn't hear any vocals. Bass and treble. My parents thought that was amazing. They're very hard of hearing now. And then the last one is focus on higher frequencies. So you choose the one that works best, it's going to give you a better result, that's it, it's real simple. Similarly, in this same panel, we have reduce reverb. And just as with denoise, this one has the same UI, the same interface, it's the same, same thing, but now we're actually minimizing echo. So for this, the echo, we might want to use a broadband echo removal. So I'll start playing this back again. It's going to be a little difficult to hear in this venue, but same concept applies. And by the way, you'll see that you get this frequency graph. How do you leave a footprint? Well, first you're going to have to leave home, go to the crazy place. And when these frequencies start to cross, this is also visually telling you like where you should be focusing on. And what you will notice, I talked about our little sensei action. It is automatically adjusting the gain. So as you pull out that echo, it's pushing that voice forward. It's doing the thing that I said was the most difficult, which is simulating the microphone getting closer, right? If you're talking all the way in the back and I'm capturing you from here, that's 100 feet. I don't, I'm bad with feet. That's far. So this moves it automatically for you using some machine learning, all right? Fast, easy, simple even if no one's coming. All right, again, I can't hear it in here, so you're just gonna have to try it out for yourself. So many more amazing things in Audition. Again, it's all about efficiency and performance, punch and roll, ambience auto ducking. Check it out today. If you wanna actually take it for a test drive yourself, we've got pods on the other side of the stage. Thank you so much for joining me. NAB Day One, we will see you next time. Take care, everybody, bye-bye. <laughs> Uh, hello. All right. Hi, guys. Um, cool. So I just learned a lot.